Hello, and welcome to our third fall 2021 brown bag lecture presented by the Morrow Institute for Peace and Justice at St. Paul's College, and in collaboration with the University of Manitoba's Peace and Conflict Studies graduate programs. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit, spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. We are happy that we can work on these lands. My name is Charlotte Enns, and I am the director of the Morrow Institute for Peace and Justice. And uh, I am very pleased to say that 2021 marks the 15th consecutive year of the Brown Bag Lectures. And that at this point, we have hosted over 100 lectures during that, those past 15 years. I do want to um, let you know that Today's lecture is being recorded and it will be available on the Morrow Institute's YouTube channel in the coming days. A link to this channel is also being added to the Morrow Institute's Brown Bag Lecture webpage, if you'd like to find it that way. So today we are very fortunate to welcome a guest lecturer uh, from another university, Binghamton University in New York, who just happens to be here in Winnipeg this week, Dr. Kerry Wiggum. He is Assistant Professor of Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention at the Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention at Binghamton University in New York. Welcome, Kerry. Thank you uh, so much. He's also the Director of Research and Online Education at the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities. So uh, today he's coming to us, you might recognize the background from the uh, um, Canadian Museum for Human Rights, thanks to our the kind hospitality of our friends there. And uh, Dr. Wiggum has been welcome to use that space there in downtown Winnipeg for today's lecture. So uh, welcome to the Brown Bag Podium. And um, to start us off, I just want to ask you a few questions to maybe introduce yourself. So first of all, I wanna know a little bit about what you do at Binghamton uh, University in terms of your teaching and research. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really an honor to be here and speak with you all today. Uh, from Winnipeg, from uh, Ancestral Lands on Treaty 1 territory. Uh, so at Binghamton University's Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention, this is a fairly new uh, institute. We're only in our fifth year, uh, but the institute was created to uh, bridge gaps that exist between academics, practitioners, and policymakers. And really all of the projects that we do at the institute focus on, uh, on, on this goal. Um, ranging from um, teaching uh, higher uh, educators in universities uh, around uh, New York State and, and eventually around the world on incorporating atrocity prevention into their curriculum, no matter what discipline they're coming from, to working with policymakers um, and, of course, uh, uh, educating students. We have um, the first of its kind masters in, in genocide and mass atrocity prevention um, uh, at Binghamton. Um, uh, I know that there's also an amazing program here at uh, University of Manitoba as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, my research in particular focuses on the way that societies, both at the state and civil society levels, um, respond to histories of mass atrocity um, through transitional justice and memory practices, uh, hopefully in a preventive mode. That's definitely the, the goal of, of the research that I, that I work on in particular. Very interesting. And so then can you also tell us a little bit about uh, what your role is with the Auschwitz Institute? Sure. So the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities is an international non-governmental organization. Um, we have offices in five countries around the world, in New York, 
um, uh, in Argentina, Romania, Uganda, uh, and uh, oh gosh, now I'm forgetting one. Oh, Poland, of course. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the institute was created to work primarily with government officials on um, training and providing technical assistance in developing policy for long-term atrocity prevention. And within that framework, I work as director of research in online education. So um, the research component of that is carrying out a, an array of research initiatives that try to focus on how prevention can be implemented within policy initiatives. And uh, the online education part is uh, we provide online trainings uh, to uh, government officials around the world, um, especially in the Great Lakes region of Africa, um, in Latin America and, uh, and now in the um, Mediterranean basin as well, though that is constantly expanding. Um, and it's just another way of sort of uh, um, uh, helping provide assistance to states around the world as they develop creative solutions for dealing with the very particular problems that each society is facing. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, I do apologize. Of course, your phone always rings right in the middle of something like this when you're working at home. Um, sorry about that interruption. Um, so uh, the other thing I, I am curious about is uh, your PhD is in performance studies. How do you go from that to working uh, in genocide prevention or human rights uh, focuses? Yeah, it was a very long and winding path. I actually, in a former life, was a, a professional theater director, and I wanted to go to grad school so I could become a, a, a university teacher to sort of supplement my directing habit. So uh, I went to a graduate program at New York University for performance studies, thinking I was going to be studying theater studies. And I found out that while there are some people in, in this discipline that study traditional modes of performance, like theater and dance, for instance, there are also others of us who study things like political processes or religious ritual, um, social movements as performance through a performative lens. Um, so this is sort of the direction that my life took. Um, I, uh, I, I still love theater, but I sort of uh, left it behind largely to focus on uh, the performance of governing in a preventive mode and, and memory in particular. Um, that said, uh, one of the things that I really believe personally and the institutions where I work strongly believe is that prevention is not work that only happens within the halls of government. It's something that uh, requires all sectors of society uh, to participate in and the arts certainly have a really big role to play uh, in preventive work. Um, and actually the reason why I'm in Winnipeg right now at the Canadian Museum in particular is because um, the Auschwitz Institute uh, uh, worked with the museum on a, a temporary exhibition that's now in the museum called Artivism, which uh, features the work of six artists or art collectives from six different countries around the world that have experienced atrocity. Um, and these artists and collectives have used art as a tool for rebuilding and for social and political transformation in the aftermath of atrocity. So this exhibition um, is meant to show how prevention is something that happens across societies and that there are any number of tools that can be used um, in this collective effort to prevent identity-based violence. Wow, that sounds like a great show. I hope people are able to uh, uh, take that in and, and, and visit the museum uh, while it's there. And, and thank you for bringing it or being part of the group that brought it here. Um, it's really true, my, my, my daughter's an artist and she always says with contemporary art, you shouldn't be asking what is art, but what is art for? And I think that's a really good uh, fit with, with the kinds of things that, that, you're, that the, the artists that you're featuring there are doing with their art. So again, welcome to, to welcome here and thank you for that background information. Um, I do want to hand over the floor shortly, but I just want to say to the audience that there will be time for questions following Dr. Wiggum's presentation. So please feel free to put your questions into the uh, Q&A um, ch uh, chat, or not the chat, but the Q&A section on the, on the forum. And if time, we do try and maybe give you voice. Uh, Jason Brennan, our, the, uh, uh, operations manager at the Morrow Institute is behind the scenes here and he will do the magic with the technology to try and 
uh, give people voice as well if if we can work that out. But uh, do do uh, know that there will be time for questions. So um, with no further ado, I would like to give the floor over to you, Dr. Wiggum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm, I'm so grateful for the invitation. It's really a, a privilege to be here today. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see uh, the presentation now. So um, today uh, in this talk, I wanted to describe a little bit about my work, which looks at how genocidal and atrocity violence has an enduring legacy that far exceeds the physical violence that's most often associated with it. And after that, I wanna offer a framework for responding to those resonating impacts of violence in a preventive mode. The ideas of this presentation come from uh, my forthcoming book, which draws from several cases, including uh, the Holocaust, indigenous genocide in the United States, and the last military dictatorship in Argentina. And today I'll be drawing primarily from the, the last of these cases, though there are plenty of examples to draw from these other cases and other cases all over the world. Hopefully you'll see that. Um, by offering examples from more than 10 years of field work in Argentina, which has included ethnographic interviews of government officials and memory actors, participant observation of memory practices, and also a number of consultations that I've had both as a researcher and as uh, through my work at the Auschwitz Institute with policymakers, on policy development for memory and prevention, I first wanna illustrate the often obscured facets of large scale political violence before de depicting how the risk factors established through that violence can and have been mitigated through memory initiatives, both at the state and the civil society levels, thus making the recurrence of such violence less likely. To do this, I wanna begin by introducing the concept of resonant violence an idea I've developed to illuminate exactly how genocidal violence functions and continues to impact societies. Next, I'll outline a framework for understanding the prevention of such violence, not as crisis intervention, as it's so often understood, but as risk mitigation. And finally, I'm gonna provide three examples from Argentina that demonstrate how memory initiatives by state, but principally civil society actors, have responded to the resonating effects of, res of this violence in a way that's mitigated risk and made recurrence less likely. Resonant violence, uh, uh, again, is a term I developed to describe the affective energy of large scale state-sponsored violence that continues to resonate long after physical killing um, and physical violence comes to an end. Uh, until it is transformed through mitigating actions. So by talking about this affective energy, I'm, I'm referencing the growing field of affect theory, which explores the social qualities of emotion, the way that it's transmitted between individual and social bodies, leading to very real impacts in how these bodies interact. Um, resonant violence is the force that comes before what we typically label as genocide, it's the social and political uh, atmosphere that allows for genocide to take place. But it also endures long after that physical violence comes to an end. And it is what is responsible for the less visible but more enduring forms of violence. When the killing stops, um, in, in, in these cases of mass atrocity, there's also this illusion, right, that the violence has stopped as well. But really, unless that violence is addressed through other means, these other forms of violence established through mass atrocity have, are much more likely to endure. So I'm talking about things like institutionalized discrimination toward groups, economic disparity among groups, social divisions and fragmentation that, that continue these, um, uh, uh, I, I, the risk for identity-based tensions among groups. And when these factors are left, these more affective and less easy to nail down factors are left untended, this resonant violence produces the risk factors that make recurrence much more likely. So I wanna give some examples of what I mean, looking at the context of Argentina. So Argentina experienced its last military dictatorship uh, between 1976 and 1983. Like uh, all of the dictatorships that, that um, uh, happened in the region of Latin America during this period in the 70s and 80s in particular. Um, these all happened against the backdrop of the Cold War, 
um, and uh, the subsequent, the, the rise of leftist movements in Latin America. Um, and that rise in leftist movements led to a real fear uh, within the country and uh, within uh, other countries, like especially the United States, uh, a fear that communism would, would spread into the region. Uh, a region that the U.S., even several years ago, when John Kerry was Secretary of State, uh, referred to Latin America as the U.S.'s backyard, quite um, patronizingly. Uh, so against this backdrop, this military, military coup happened in 1976. And it was not just um, a, a, a military dictatorship meant to repress political subversion, as it was termed, but it was also about pushing a, a neoliberal economic agenda that was coming straight from um, the halls of government in Washington and you know, the Chicago boys out of the University of Chicago uh, economics departments. Uh, during this dictatorship, political parties and labor unions were outlawed, Congress was disbanded, and as many as 30,000 Argentinians were disappeared during this period. 500 or more clandestine detention and torture centers sprung up around the country uh, where these disappeared people were imprisoned and tortured before being killed. The dictatorship fell and democracy returned in 1983. And there's a whole, I mean, this is a very brief outline of this dictatorship. Obviously there's a whole uh, a set of complications that, that I'm not getting into here. But when democracy returned in 1983, this brought an end to the widespread use of state terrorism and physical killing or disappearance. But the violence continued in other more effective ways that exemplify what I mean by the concept of resonant violence. And I'll give you three very concrete examples. About 500 of the people who were disappeared during the dictatorship were pregnant at the time of their disappearance. Uh, those women were kept alive until they came to term. When they delivered their babies, they were murdered. And the babies were given to military families or allies of military families, for instance, to raise as their own. And those children had no idea of their true identity. Uh, they, uh, they were raised uh, as if they were part of that family uh, that, that biologically in, in most cases. Um, still today, there are many of these uh, children now, adults in their 30s and 40s, who don't know their true identities, uh, that they were appropriated children, though thanks to the work of um, the grandmothers of the Plaza de Macho, a very important human rights organization, 131 of these, ch these children, now adults, have, have, have come to know their true identity. But this is just a very concrete way of how the impacts of this violence have continued long after. Impunity is another way that the violence continues. After a brief series of trials that worked to bring orchestrators to justice in Argentina, threats of continued military violence and other coups brought justice proceedings in the country to a close, leading to what's usually referred to in Argentina as this era of impunity. And during that period of impunity, families of the disappeared were forced to live with their loss and no visible hope of justice in sight. And finally, another impact of the dictatorship that usually isn't discussed are the so-called vicias miserias, or slums um, on the outskirts of Buenos Aires. During the dictatorship, there was vast new construction projects um, that, that displaced uh, large populations of socially undesirable sectors of the society that ultimately were forced to move to the outskirts of the city and live in utter poverty um, in uh, constructed slums with no infrastructure, no paved roads, in many cases, no electricity or running water. And these vishas still exist today. Um, uh, many people live in these vishas sort of outside of the, the realm of social responsibility of others in Argentina. And this is a direct result uh, of, of something that was produced through the economic regime, the economic violence of the dictatorship that remains in place. Now, if we only think about atrocity violence as physical, and we only think about prevention as bringing an end to that physical killing, then we could say that the job in Argentina was done in 1983, when the dictatorship came to an end and democracy resumed. We could, in other words, ignore all of these resounding impacts of the violence or confront them only on an ad hoc basis, as if they're not connected in some way to this violence of the past. 
Why is it important to understand that these three examples are not just byproducts of the atrocity violence of the dictatorship, but actually continuations of it in new forms? Focusing only on the physical qualities of atrocity violence ignores the complexity of genocide and other atrocities and, and the ways that the complex ways that society suffer from that violence. It also reinforces a view of prevention as only crisis management, as only bringing an end to the most visible um, uh, forms of violence uh, that, that violence takes. Um, rather than thinking about prevention as a long-term project, as actually trying to address the structural inequities so that things don't escalate to the point of reaching mass violence. Accepting the concept that genocidal violence endures in the form of resonant violence and that this resonant violence actually produces and sustains the risk factors that could lead to more violence opens new avenues for real prevention, long-term prevention, and I hope I can explain why. Thinking from a policy perspective then, once we understand that resonant violence is a reality, we can understand and measure resonant violence through the risk factors that it produces. And assessing risk then gives us a really clear path for preventing the recurrence of atrocities. Now, what, I, what do I mean when I'm talking about risk factors? Over the last several decades, there's been a real boom in risk assessment within atrocity prevention. This started with Helen Fine uh, in the 19, and Barbara Harf in the 1990s developing their risk model uh, assessment models that try to identify mostly quantitatively what are the factors that statistically put our society most uh, at risk for experiencing atrocity violence. Um, since those initial models, now there have been an array of newer ones, including from the Early Warning Project, um, the Atrocity Forecasting Project, the Political Instability Task Force. These risk factors on the screen now are from a model developed by my colleague at the Auschwitz Institute, James Waller, and the UN Framework of Analysis for Atrocity Crimes. All of these are different models identifying the risk factors that we should be looking out for if we're trying to prevent things from escalating to the point of atrocity. What's Amazing is that across all of these different models, there's actually a pretty high degree of consistency. There's some a, 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 a fair amount of consensus that exists over many of these risk factors, um, though each of them also has some of their own particularities. But one risk factor that we see again and again in all almost all of these models is um, prior genocide or politicide, a society that has experienced atrocity in the past is more likely, statistically speaking, in most models, significantly more likely to experience such violence in the future. So what does that mean? Does that just mean that these societies are doomed for recurrence? Well, no, of course not, because we also know that there are many cases uh, of societies where genocide or other political violence has occurred and that violence hasn't recurred. Um, so this is not a guarantee. It doesn't mean that societies are doomed to re-experience violence. For me, the reason it's a risk factor is because of the way resonant violence functions. Societies think the violence is gone, but it continues in these obscured forms that produce and sustain risk. The consensus and success of these risk assessment tools provide us with a roadmap, however, for responding to resonant violence and preventing its recurrence in a much more long-term way. So how can risk assessment models help us measure prevention and preventive impact. Well, measuring prevention is notoriously a difficult uh, task, um, especially for people who are already skeptical of the potential to prevent atrocities. Um, and the argument they'll bring up most often is this so-called non-event problem. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have is, you know, if uh, a policy initiative succeeds at preventing an atrocity, then nothing happens. Uh, and, uh, but we don't know if nothing happened because of the initiative or if nothing happened because it was never going to happen to begin with, right? Um, so this leads to this real big catch-22 in prevention work. But to me, this is a really limited way of looking at and measuring prevention for two reasons. One, because it's impossible, it sets an impossible standard to prove efficacy in prevention. But two, because this idea reinforces a, a notion that there's some sort of silver bullet 
um, a single initiative that that's on its own can do all of the work of prevention. And this is an incredibly um, uh, dangerous idea to have. Atrocities are complex social and political problems, and they require complex solutions, not single interventions. So we need to disabuse ourselves of the notion that any single action can on its own be preventive. What we need are many, 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 many preventive actions, right? Risk assessment helps predict risk for atrocity, right? So then if we, if we believe that, and there is a great deal of consensus on that, then the reverse has to also be true, that mitigating risk factors coincides with increasing preventive capacity, all right? So then what we can argue is an initiative is contributing to prevention, not single-handedly accomplishing the goal of prevention, but contributing to prevention if it mitigates one or more risk factors in, uh, in some way. In a post-atrocity context then, one, one really clear way to mitigate risk in the present is by addressing this period in the past that helped to produce that risk. This requires initiatives that look backward, that respond directly to the past in order to shape the present. In other words, this requires initiatives focused on memory. And when I talk about memory, what I mean is not uh, something that exists in the heads of individuals or the minds of individuals only, but memory as a social force, as the phenomenon that describes the way that the past impacts the present and shapes our collective visions for the future. Memory initiatives then our initiatives are uh, activities that aim to commemorate or enhance understanding of a conflicted past. So this is how I'm thinking about these things. So now I wanna, what I wanna explore is the way that some of these memory initiatives can contribute to mitigating risk and therefore uh, uh, increasing preventive capacity. There's a, a great deal of debate about the preventive capacity of memory that I wanna acknowledge first. And there's two sides of this, this debate, as there so often are, right? The first side, this very pro-memory side, um, is articulated really well by this thought by George, the philosopher George Santayana, who said, he who does not remember the past is condemned to repeat it. And within this side is this notion that memory is somehow inherently preventive, and that simply by remembering the past, um, uh, that on its own is going to do the preventive work and, and make sure that, that the violence will not recur. This is an incredibly optimistic and I think naive way of looking at the way that memory functions. But then there's the other side of this argument that argues the exact opposite. And this is articulated really well by um, uh, David Reif, who several years ago published a book called In Praise of Forgetting, um, in which he said, okay, far too often collective historical memory has led to war rather than peace to rancor and resentment rather than reconciliation, and to the determination to exact revenge rather than commit to the hard work of forgiveness. So Reef's argument and this school of thought's argument is that uh, we have absolutely no evidence that memory has ever contributed to prevention. And in fact, more often, uh, in many, many cases, memory has contributed to only uh, increasing divisions among groups, increasing risk, and therefore, in those cases, the best thing that we can hope for is to forget the past and move forward. And this, for me, is an equally naive way of looking at the way that memory functions. It's absolutely true that memory can increase divisions and risk. But the idea that people in a society that have experienced the highest levels of violence imaginable could ever simply forget and move forward without actively dealing with that experience of violence is magical thinking, right? So if that's not an option, then what we need to think is, and if, and, and if memory is not on its own preventive, if it can in fact be dangerous, then the challenge then becomes, how can memory be used in a way that it can be productive and preventive within these societies? So I start from the premise then that memory is not always and only preventive. In fact, it can be used to do the exact opposite um, to increase uh, risk for atrocity. But memory is also dynamic. Uh, it is always changing. Our orientations to the past and the way that we understand the past are constantly in a state of flux. 
And that fact actually presents both an opportunity and a challenge. It's an opportunity because if we're living in a society where memory is increasing risk, increasing division, it doesn't mean it's always going to be that way. There's an opportunity to change it. But it's also a challenge because if we're living, if we do this work of making it so that our memory with the past leads to um, positive and productive relationships in the present, it doesn't mean it's just going, like we've ticked the box and can move on. It's a constant process um, that we can't take for granted because we all know from experience, uh, and we can look at the news um, today. Uh, all over the world, and maybe in our own backyard, certainly in my country, the United States, that um, uh, political actors, social actors at any moment can pull up old memory narratives and activate them to justify the most horrific policy initiatives that we can imagine um, that violate the human rights of groups all over. Um, so memory is a constant process and a project that we have to be working on. But memory can be preventive when we work for it to be. And I wanna give you three examples from Argentina of memory initiatives that have directly called on the past to respond to the resonating effects of mass violence in the present and thus reduce the risk produced by that resonant violence, making its recurrence less likely. The first comes from um, uh, this movement uh, of a, a civil society group called Hijos in Argentina, Hijos, which in Spanish means sons or daughter, sons and daughters. Uh, but in this case, it's an acronym, the English translation of which would be Sons and Daughters for Identity and Justice Against Forgetting and Silence. And EHOS is a group that started in the 1990s in this era of impunity, where the perpetrators were living free and unpunished for the crimes committed during the dictatorship. And EHOS responded to that impunity uh, and this lack of justice, um, two big risk factors that many risk assessment models identify by starting a practice called escraches. Um, escrache comes from a slang verb, escrachar, which means to uncover or to bring something to light. And that is exactly what the escraches sought to do. They were large um, street demonstrations that took place in the front of houses of known perpetrators of human rights abuses during the dictatorship that were meant to make all of the neighbors of that perpetrator know that they were living amidst an unpunished perpetrator of atrocity. They would have these protests and for instance, they would mark the house of the perpetrator with red paint. They would paint on the street in front of the house, like in this picture, here lives a perpetrator of genocide with an arrow pointing to the house. And the idea of these escraches was to levy in lieu of the, the sentence that the state was not levying by putting these people on trial, they were going to levy, levy what they called a social, a condena social or a social sentence. Um, and the idea was if the state wasn't going to put them in prison, then their own house should become a prison for them. Once their neighbors find out that they're living among a person, uh, next to a person who did this, then the baker will stop selling him bread the taxi driver stopped driving him places, the newspaper vendor stopped selling him newspapers. The idea that their own house becomes the prison that the state is refusing to put them in. But Hijos also had a slogan, si no hay justicia, hay escrache. If there's no justice, there will be escrache. This was a promise, a promise that the escraches would continue until trials reopened, but also a promise that if the state resumed responsibility, of, of, uh, of uh, enacting the rule of law, of putting these people on trial, then the escraches would end because what they wanted was real justice, not this version of justice that they were trying to enact. And ultimately the escraches, along with other human rights movements in Argentina, led to the reopening of trials against perpetrators in 2005. And today over 1200 of these perpetrators have been brought to justice through the legal system, strengthening uh, that the rule of law in Argentina. A second example is the process called impugnación, or maybe public impugning, we could call it in English. Um, a weakened, uh, Argentina had a very weakened judiciary uh, in this period of impunity after the dictatorships, and the military still presented an active threat, as I mentioned. There had been no active vetting or illustration processes to remove military officers who had performed human rights abuses from their ranks, of course, and many of them are still um, in their uh, positions today, 
Uh, and the military continues to exist under a code of silence where they refuse to provide any evidence uh, or information about the crimes committed. So given this reality and the risks that were produced by these weakened judicial structures, one civil society group called CELS, or the Center for Legal and Social Studies would be the translation, responded to this by taking advantage of two uh, uh, points in the new constitution, unrelated points, but that they found and used in a very creative way. The first was a point that said that military promotions, while they were suggested by the executive, had to be sent to the legislature for approval anytime an officer was being promoted to a higher rank. And a second point that they found somewhere else said that the legislator was obligated to hold public hearings on all topics and explain how they responded to public opinion in their final decisions. So CELS saw these two points and created this process that they called impugnación. So when the executive would uh, hire, uh, uh, suggest an officer for promotion, CELS would look within an archive that it had created that it had developed over years of the crimes committed during the dictatorship and provide evidence of any human rights abuses perpetrated by that officer to the Senate of Argentina. Um, the Senate then had to have public hearings where that evidence was made public before they, made, they approved the promotion. And the legislators could still promote the officer despite the evidence, but if they did, they were required by law to explain why they went against the public testimony. So this started off as a bit of a weak mechanism, but now it has grown to be incredibly powerful to the point where it's very difficult for anyone to be promoted uh, if they go through a process of impugnación. So this is a way that, uh, a really creative way that the civil society and now the state responds to risk factors relating to impunity and also to weakened state structures, to strengthen those structures again. And finally, Sites of memory can play a really big role in post-atrocity contexts and transforming the way that societies deal with the past. And uh, there's really no better example than, uh, of that than um, the Sitio de Memoria ESMA in, uh, in Buenos Aires. ESMA during the dictatorship was the largest clandestine detention and torture center in operation. Um, and uh, after the dictatorship ended, it remained under military control because it was a Navy training school. Um, and they used it as a way of hiding and obscuring evidence of the crimes committed by the military during the dictatorship. So the way that ESMA has been transformed has actually really responded to one risk factor relating to atrocities, which is that um, we know that atrocities are more likely to take place in societies that lack a strong and organized uh, and representative civil society. ESMA has become a hub for civil society life in, S in Argentina. So literally this place where the violence was perpetrated has now become a place for the, the most vibrant human rights activism that the country has, I, I would argue. In 2004, President Nestor Kirchner reclaimed ESMA from the Navy and reopened it to the public. And now it is a public memory site. Now ESMA is actually a huge complex of 34 buildings that take up a lot, a lot of space. One of those buildings was the place where it disappeared, people were imprisoned and tortured. And that building is now a public museum and memory site where people can learn about the crimes of the dictatorship. But what are they gonna do with these other 33 buildings? Well, what they did was quite creative. One of the buildings was transformed into a cultural center that hosts theatrical productions, uh, concerts, art exhibitions, film festivals. There's also a cafe and bookstore where people, it's become a hub of community life in the city of Buenos Aires. People come um, to attend these events that are all related to memory in some way, that are all free and open to the public. And then they stay around to talk, to, um, uh, uh, to plan, to organize um, within this space. The other buildings were all given to various human rights NGOs or institutions that are meant to respond to the violence of the past and promote and protect human rights in the present. So both branches of the mothers of the Plaza de Mancho have a building here. The grandmothers and hijos also have a building here. The National Archive of Memory, which contains all of the testimonies of, of, of victims and survivors are co collected here. And also the Argentine Forensic Anthropology Team, which is a team that developed um, the, for the time the most innovative practices in identifying the remains of victims of human rights abuses um, 
and now those those uh, lessons learned from the Argentine forensic team have also informed practices all over the world, including in places like Guatemala, Bosnia, and now in Canada uh, with the recovery of the remains of children of uh, who died in the residential schools. So what we see here is the transformation of the space of violence into a space that cultivates a human rights oriented civil society serving as a mitigating factor for resident violence. True atrocity prevention that extends beyond mere crisis management and intervention requires a holistic view of atrocity violence and the way that it functions. It requires practitioners to understand how this violence endures long after the physical forms of violence come to an end, resulting in other more obscure forms of violence, including institutional discrimination, social fragmentation, and economic disparity. I call these enduring qualities of uh, mass atrocities resonant violence. Resonant violence produces and sustains risk. It's a reason a history of identity-based violence is one of the most effective predictors of future episodes of violence. But recognizing the ways this violence endures does not mean resonant violence cannot be transformed. When stakeholders accept that resonant violence exists, actions can be taken to respond to it, mitigating the risks that it produces. The examples I've offered here illustrate exactly how confronting resonant violence through memory initiatives that acknowledge its roots and its continuing existence offer a clear path for diffusing the power of resonant violence to produce risk, thus making the recurrence of atrocity violence far less likely. Thanks very much. I look forward to your questions and thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Wiggum. Wow, those are very important concepts, resonant violence and risk mitigation. Um, uh, thank you for introducing that. We've, we've already got some questions for you, so uh, I hope you're ready for that. Uh, both a, a question and a greeting from uh, Napas um, Kabiswa. Um, I want to uh, recognize that uh, um, he was here uh, for a brown bag lecture himself. Uh, well, just before uh, COVID hit, so in February of 2020, um, and uh, uh, visited the Morrow Institute. So thank you for being here. And I think Jason's able to let you ask your question, uh, Dr. Kabiswa, if you are interested in talking to uh, Carrie directly. Oh, thank you. Hi, thank, you so, <laughs> thank you so lot. And thank you, uh, Kerry, uh, for this amazing, uh, you, you like your memory uh, uh, stuff. It's, it's a difficult one. And today I've heard clearly that you yourself make, you know that memory has the two sides. It's, uh, it can be dangerous and it can be uh, useful. And I, I share your, your view, but I tend to go with those who say memory is dangerous, even if I am 40% 40, 40 with you. So, <laughs> because what I live in, in the, the African Great Lakes region, it is about memory and Kwibuka in Rwanda doing things in the Congo. Mm -hmm. And if you look, if you hear discourses from one of the generals, of Rwanda named, uh, his name is, uh, I don't remember. His name, he says, okay, we are lucky because we can do this war outside of our country. So doing it in Congo is good for them, but it's a, about memory. So thank you for your discourse. And I, my, I want to know if you make difference between memory uh, no, uh, resonant violence and hatred. And if they are different, aren't they related? So that's my question. Thank you so much for that, Nopes. I really appreciate that, that intervention and the question. Um, first, I would say that uh, I, I agree with you in so many contexts. It feels especially present around the world today where we see memory being used to stoke 
division, fragmentation, fear, hatred, absolutely. Um, and it, it's, it's troubling. The, my response to it is, is that we can, memory can be good, memory can be bad, but memory is. Uh, it's hard to imagine societies that have experienced large scale violence that don't, where that violence doesn't continue to have, to have an impact on their present. So if we accept then that, that it's impossible to imagine a situation where we can just forget the past, then to me, but the only solution is trying to find ways in which we can make sure that memory is a productive and preventive force rather than one that is destructive and divisive. Um, that's not at all easy, um, uh, especially, uh, I mean, yes, the, I mean, the DRC is a great example of this as are many, many countries around the world, Bosnia, um, uh, I was just in Colombia uh, a couple of weeks ago or last week um, where we're seeing this very actively. Hate is absolutely a component of resident violence. Resident violence is all about affect and emotion. Um, what, uh, but it's not just hate uh, between individuals, it's also how it gets embedded within institutions, right? So um, resident violence ultimately is a way for thinking for me, and maybe it's useful for, for others, I hope, uh, is a way of thinking about how relationships are built between people and how our identities are constructed against other people's identities through these the process of violence. Uh, so hate is one of one way that we describe, I think, when the inst there are institutions socially and uh, politically that put pe pit people against each other, right? That create an other against which our identity is formed. Um, but I think that there are also ways of institutionalizing, if not love, then other values, other positive emotions that, that dissipate that relationality between or among individuals. I think love is a lot to ask for uh, in post-atrocity contexts. Um, I think sometimes the best we can hope for, at least in the short term, is um, you know, an absence of active killing. Um, I don't know that our goal should ever be to um, reach a place of total consensus, but what the goal should be, in my view, is reaching a place where disputes can be um, debated, discussed, um, ironed out through democratic processes um, rather than on battlefields, um, uh, whether those battlefields be through war or in the neighborhoods of people living in deeply divided societies. Um, it's a it's much easier said than done. <laughs> of course. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh. Thank you. Uh, we do have another question um, from Vadim Atnashev, and uh, um, I believe this person had to leave, but um, I think it's a good question. So we'll uh, we'll put it up for discussion. Uh, Dr. Wiggum, thank you for your presentation. Can we compare? the situation in Argentina and the modern China, the genocidal acts against the ethnic and religious minorities. If we can, what measures must be applied to stop the state terrorism nowadays? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, I'm uh, obviously a comparativist. Uh, my, the, the book, for instance, is I told you about three different cases. Um, that in some ways are related and in some ways have no relationship whatsoever, aside from the fact that uh, it was identity-based violence. I, uh, I tend to think that there's a great deal that we can learn from applying the lessons of some places to another, but I think we also have to always attend to the fact that every situation has its own contextual realities and specificities. And in many ways, um, the violence that happened in um, Argentina was happening in a, and what's happening in China today is happening in a very different context. That said, I think there are lessons learned. Um, what's, what's a, the genocide occurring right now in China, particularly with the Uyghur minority, um, is I think one of the most daunting challenges of our time. At, uh, at Binghamton uh, uh, IG map, we call it, so we don't have to say Institute for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention every time. At IG map, we have visiting practitioners who come and spend um, some time with us uh, a week uh, visiting our students and faculty and, and teaching us about the work that they're doing in the field. And we were very lucky last month to have um, Rushan Abbas, who's the executive director of Campaign for Uyghurs, 
Um, she's um, an incredible Uyghur activist um, doing work to raise awareness and, and make change to bring an end to the genocide against Uyghurs in China right now. And um, listening to her and learning from her uh, was both inspiring because of the, uh, the work that she's doing to, to have an impact and also incredibly demotivating because it just seems like such a daunting challenge because of the economic and political power of China right now. Um, there seems, it seems really hard um, to expect that uh, 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 to expect uh, some governments to take decisive action, especially the U.S. government, um, they don't seem to be doing much more than than condemning it verbally. Um, in the case of that, the one thing I learned from her is that that we have a lot of individual responsibility, and even though that seems small, um, if that's what we have, we have to act on it. Eighty percent of uh, the cotton grown in China comes from Xinjiang province and is being farmed by enslaved Uyghurs. So when we're buying clothing and we see a t-shirt with the label made in China, we have to acknowledge that what we are doing if we buy that shirt, even though it's, more, it's less expensive than the other shirt that's made in Canada or the US, is that we are, we are supporting slave labor, yeah? Uh, when we stay at a Hilton hotel, uh, Hilton is uh, right now building a, a hotel on the grounds of a destroyed mosque uh, that the Chinese government destroyed uh, uh, in their genocidal process to destroy not only Uyghur people, but Uyghur, Uyghur culture. Um, so we are supporting that. Um, so these are the actions that I'm personally trying to take um, in addition to writing my representatives and making sure that they know that this is an issue that I care about, that I will vote. My vote depends on their response to it. But of course, for that to have an impact, we need many, many, many of us to take, uh, to take similar and, uh, and, and different actions as well. Um, and hopefully what that leads to is a groundswell where our elected representatives understand that, that their place in elected office requires them to take actions on these things as well. That, that we as Americans or Canadians care about what happens to ethnic minorities in other countries around the world. Thank you so much. It's always an important reminder that uh, even though it feels like it's not making a difference, some of our individual actions, um, you know, need to be taken, need to add up to something. Um, uh, Jason, are there any questions from uh, Facebook or uh, not, something? Not right now at the moment, uh, Dr. Enns, but if people do want to uh, raise their hand, I'd be happy to recognize them and allow them to ask their questions and uh, I'll watch for that. Okay. I don't see any others here at the moment uh, either. I think so... one just popped up in the chat. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> chat. That's why. Okay. Um, I will ask uh, our questioner if she would like to ask her question. So there we go. Hi there, um, my name is Shelley Clay Robison. Thank you so much for sharing your work. I was wondering if you could talk more about how the arts are a way to address resident violence in the lives of everyday people. So how are the arts functioning in this capacity to um, like shift mindsets, empower people, create a narrative, et cetera? Thank you so much for that question, Shelley. And this is really, um, a lot of the work that we're trying to do by creating this artivism exhibition that's now at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights um, to show how art isn't just um, a way of uh, processing uh, past violence or, um, but it's also, uh, it can play a really active role in social and political transformation. I'll give you two examples that come directly from the exhibition. One is we feature the art um, of a group called um, Grupo de Arte Callejero, our street art group would be the translation, but it's GAC um, in Argentina. And this is a group that worked with uh, escraches that I already described of hijos. And what they did was they created street signs that looked like real, they look like real street signs, but um, they feature our traffic signs, but they feature iconography that reveals um, the crimes of the dictatorship. And they would even say things like, okay, 
Um, five, attention, 500 meters from here lives this person who was a perpetrator of genocide. So it's using this language of the state to play this role that the state wasn't doing, to, to bring to light the violence that the state was trying to tamper down. Um, and the role of GAC and other art groups working in collaboration with um, ICOS was one of the reasons that such visibility was garnered around this movement that led to the reopening of trials and the reinstitution of the rule of law. But they can also have other impacts on communities of people who have been, um, who have suffered violence. And I think a great example of that comes from another piece by a Bosnian American artist named Aida Shechovic. Um, uh, she created a, a piece called Stotenema, which means in Bosnian, why are you not here? This is a piece uh, to commemorate the 8,372 Bosnian Muslim, mostly men and boys who died in the genocide in Srebrenica in July, 1995. And to do this, she worked with victim communities and survivor communities to collect from them uh, small coffee cups called filjan, um, because the, these communities would often say to her that the time they missed their loved ones the most, the ones who had died in the genocide, was in the morning when they had to have coffee alone, because coffee is a very communal experience in Bosnia. So Aida started collecting these cups, and each year on the anniversary of the genocide, she would invite passersby to fill the cups and leave them undrunk in a public square uh, in memory of those, um, those victims who are not able to drink coffee with their families. But what's an amazing byproduct of this is, so this monument traveled on July 11th to a different city around the world each year, and especially to cities that had a diasporic Bosnian refugee population. And what happened through the, the installation of this monument each July 11th was, that a community that had been dispelled and sent around the world because of genocidal violence was reassembled through this act. And not only reassembled with other diasporic Bosnians, but also with non-Bosnian people from local communities who learned about and uh, were able to take this moment to remember in solidarity with them, those that had been, that had been lost through this genocide. One of the main goals of what genocide does and what resident violence does is to break apart societies, to, 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 to break people apart from each other, yeah? So these acts, and art does a particularly good job of this from my view, of reassembling groups, of rebuilding society, has a very real impact and a preventive impact in my perspective. And uh, it's something that art is uh, particularly um, uh, good at. <laughs> So true. Um, Jason, I think you wanted to mention something that you've put. Well, just very briefly, uh, Dr. Wigan was referencing things going on in, in China and things that people can do. It's just in the news today in CBC, there's a start -up story about tomatoes uh, grown in, in China by, by those laborers. Uh, I just put it in the chat for people to see and share. Um, interesting tomatoes because uh, they're, they're sold as Italian tomatoes, but grown in China. But of course, the tomatoes originally come from China. So anyway, a lot of interesting things there. And, and I just threw that for people. But there is another question, and it's uh, Bobby who has the question. And Bobby, I'm going to invite you to speak if you'd like to bring voice to your question. Okay, sure. I can speak. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. <clears throat> I am in a different faculty. <laughs> I just find the brown bag series very interesting. But uh, I wanted to say thank you for your presentation. And that I was hoping, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to read my question. I was hoping you could make suggestions on how to address the Canadian context of resonant violence, because you mentioned it with the case of residential schools. So uh, a suggestion that hopefully covers and recognizes continuous violence of intergenerational trauma because it's ongoing and that the truth and reconciliation process so far has been aesthetic in my opinion and in the opinion of many indigenous people I've spoken to um, with verbal apologies and an impending Pope's visit. Like most people who, who saw that the Pope is visiting are like, well, that doesn't really do anything because the government is still fighting residential school survivors in court. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And obviously this is a shared history that Canada and the United States has with its residential schools. Um, and in fact, in the United States, we have so much more work to do than, than even Canada because there has not even been any acknowledgement really about the crimes that have taken place in the US. Um, 
that said, I understand that um, that this is a fraught process and um, and uh, uh, that that remains uh, that continues to be happening in Canada. Um, I think uh, again. Really dealing with resident violence requires all sectors of society to come together. It requires state action and it requires action from uh, other institutions, schools, media, religion. One thing that I was really um, impressed by is um, in the final recommendations of the Canadian TRC, but also in even more so, I think, in the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, um, the extent to which the, these recommendations consider that reality. That, um, that there are steps that need to be taken by all sectors of society. Um, but of course, the state has um, uh, a, a huge amount of responsibility and needs to be uh, uh, taking that. And, and it's very hard to rebuild trust between communities when the state continues to um, try to, well, to, to try claims for justice in court, right? This is, um, this is a, a, a big, big issue. Um, one thing that I, I mean, I don't have all the solutions because I'm not Canadian and I think the solutions need, I, I believe that real preventive impact uh, solutions always come from within a society rather than from without. But one thing I think that is a, a, a problematic framing of the process here is, uh, and, and this is in a lot of places, it's not just Canada, is the way the process is called a reconciliatory process. Reconciliation is a very fraught term and it also implies that there's been a period in the past where society was conciled right? And you're just trying to reconcile. Um, I think in the case of all settler colonial societies, that is a state that never existed, has never existed. So we need to be thinking uh, not about reconciliation, but um, something else. And I don't know if conciliation is the right word either. Um, I also think that it's really hard, especially um, from um, my Indigenous friends and colleagues, um, that to have real honest conversations about dealing with the past when things like um, uh, uh, the return of land can never even be part of the conversation it, because it just uh, because it, it's just a, a wall that that the state builds saying well we can never go that far that's just taking it too far and but by doing that what we're saying is basically denying uh, where the fact that settler colonial genocide is an ongoing reality is a structure and not something that uh, uh, rather than so, uh, and trying to frame it as simply something that happened in the past that is over. Um, I don't know what the solution is because it's so complicated, but every option has to be on the table. Um, in order to really start rebuilding uh, trust between communities that's what I would say, um, though. Of course, again, much easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, thank you. Yes, thank you. It is all very complicated, um, but we appreciate uh, the insights and uh, ideas you've given us today. Uh, it's been very, very thought provoking. Um, I think we've come to the end of our time. I want to uh, thank uh, the audience for being here, for your attention, for your questions. Um, and I want to thank you in particular, Dr. Carrie Wiggum, for taking the time to speak with us today, to share your ideas, and also for letting us know about the Artivism exhibit at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And I encourage everyone to try and get there. How long is it there for? Can you remind us of that? You know, actually, it, I, I think it's just been extended, so it's going to stay through June. Wonderful. Give some okay, time. so we should definitely have a chance to, to go. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, please uh, tune in, not next week, but November 19th, we have our final uh, brown bag lecture. We will be talking to Chuck Thiessen and um, learning more about the uh, Moro Institute for Peace and Justice uh, research work. So um, thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.